Hello folks and welcome back to World War II TV and what is the middle of Tragedies and Disasters Week which has seen some quite emotionally wrought discussions and the sidebar conversations have been brilliant and if I don't thank you enough for doing what you do by joining in then allow me to thank you now because sometimes I go back and re-watch my own shows with my own voice muted because I start, can't stand listening to myself just to reread properly your conversations because the information that comes across is sometimes amazing. Um, it's a, it is really a testament to how many people out there know their subject. I was just talking to Janet before he went on, on live that I think a lot of conventional TV is aiming its history at the lowest common denominator, assuming that the people out there are actually idiots and don't and need to be reminded every two minutes who the bad guys are and what year World War II started in and you know what aircraft are and who Eisenhower was. And actually, I think there's a lot of people out there who know all that stuff and want proper in-depth studies. So anyway, I digress. But we're off to Norway today. We're off to 1942. And my guest tonight has prepared a super PowerPoint uh, accompanying slides that give all the context and the, the background. So if you don't know anything about this story before you're going into this, you will certainly know a lot of it by the end of it. But there we are. I'm getting to the point where I introduce my guest. So um, Janet Oakley is a writer of historical fiction. She has a museum background, an education background. You name it, she's done it in terms of sharing history and information about the war with a wide variety of people. So um, there we are. Good, or good morning for you in your case, Janet. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for suggesting this, because that's how, in case people wonder how I find guests, in the early days, I was just using my little black book of friends. And then now it's on Twitter. I go out and put pleas out saying, I've got a week coming up about this. And hopefully people come forward with ideas. And you did. And hence we're, we're where we are. So before we get into what happened in, in Norway, 1942, I gave a bit of the game away about what you, you do for a living. But how did you discover this story? And what were you working on when you found out about it? Well, the odd thing, when I tell people that I dreamt about a man in the snow, with German soldiers hanging around him. That's how the novel, The Yussing Affair, developed. But I have to say, too, that uh, I was a student in France in 1966-67. I turned 21 over there. And uh, we were in Vichy for uh, seven weeks working, making sure our French was up to par to have all our classes in French down at Clermont-Ferrand. And uh, I'll never forget that there was a plaque in the little um, part of Vichy that was dedicated to the 25 students who were shot by the Gestapo. And one of our really good friends there, uh, Maxime Chopin, who just passed away last year, uh, his mother was living in a block where it was partially bombed out. And that had quite a, quite a thing on me. So once I had, so I think I was interested in the uh, resistance, but I started researching. And I happened to live in the Pacific Northwest where I think you can turn around and every two, third person is Norwegian descent. <laughs> mm. So I was very fortunate. Uh, I found right away a book called um, On the Mid Midnight Sun, and it's about uh, it was several series of essays and stuff about Norway. That helped me get going. But the big one that really surprised me at our local university here in town, I found two copies of the uh, British Naval Intelligence books on Norway sitting on the shelf. And it has spy map, I, it has everything that you want. So when I say my character is getting on the train coming from Trondheim going down to Kvam, if he says there's a buffet in that train station, it's there. This, these books are amazing. And uh, in fact, when I went to Trondheim four years ago, one of my host's friends had read it all the way through. And she said, you got our town right. How'd you do it? And I'm thinking like 1942 spy maps, because they're all laid out. Everything is there. And um, mm. so. well, then, I'm, I'm going to digress now, but there's a very famous book. People know which one I mean. Historical fiction set in World War II in the town of San Marlo down in Brittany. And in the mm -hmm. tourist office there, people go and try and recreate the walking route the hero in the book does and you yeah. physically can't do it. it the, the places that the walk does you can't do it they're all over the place and people get rather frustrated with it i think in the days of google earth and street view to get the basic layout of a town wrong is a little bit you know um lazy but anyway i digress in terms of study but We've, we've talked about it a little bit in World War II TV. Norway is definitely, for some people, I'm thinking about Dr. Alexander Clark, who's won a couple of shows, 
it's a really fascinating part of World War II. The number of German troops there, as you'll go into, was higher than it was in other countries, despite the small population there. It had a big role in 1940 to play in the outcome of things. Lots of what ifs and what could have happened if things had gone different in 1940. Heavy water, of course, the Germans trying to get atomic power, the resistance out there, the the, the Navy, but there's lots of stuff there. And I will at some point devote an entire week to Norway, um, uh, that be in the future. But right now, we're, we're, as I said, we're in tragedies and disasters week. So um, I'll kind of hand over to you, Janet, to kind of let, get the ball rolling. And then, as usual, I will jump in with my interruptions and comments from the audience. So, um, and yeah, again, you, fantastic information. So I'm handing over to you. There okay. we go. So hopefully, uh, this, this gives you a background. So Norway in 1940 had 3 million people. And you can see how long and skinny. You're looking on that map. You're only looking at half of it. It goes to Trondheim. And then there's another, or oh, more than a half. That's the same population uh, in Berlin in 1940. So it gives you an idea how sparse this country was. Oslo, um, Bergen, and Trondheim were the th uh, three largest cities there. So when they attacked, uh, there were sort of rumors going on. The British had laid some lines, which the Norwegians weren't happy about. But uh, they it's a concentrated attack. And one of the first people I interviewed, he said, yeah, I went to work. He was a journeyman carpenter in Trondheim. He went down. He saw all these guys standing around. And they had sort of a standing army or not in Norway, more of a reserve. And he said, who are these people? And then he went to work and he discovered that, oh my goodness, the front page says we are occupied. And his, uh, his boss was a Nazi. So right off the bat, so they hit all these things. And we can go on to the next one. Um, so what's happening too is that um, Vic Kun um, Quisling, he actually in the past had done some pretty amazing stuff. And you wonder how somebody turns because he had worked with relief with the Russians after World War I. But anyway, by the time that, um, just before the invasion, he was actually, he had met with Hitler at least once, but definitely in December 39, he was over there visiting with him. He, in March, just days before, he went to Copenhagen to meet with Nazis intelligence agents. So, and he's back on the 6th. So on the day that the invasion happened, he got on the, the radio and said he was the uh, new government and he was the prime minister which was kind of a shock to the Germans. Uh, so what happens, um, there, actually an excellent movie to watch is called The King's Choice. Mm. And it's excellent. I, it's, uh, I think, a six-part series, uh, but it's all about the, the decision that he made because they had a constitutional government that was only from like 1908, 1907, roughly, when they broke away with Sweden. And people in Norway voted that they wanted to have a king. A constitutional king. So anyway, that's a good place to get an idea. And interestingly, we could do a show one day on how each country fell, quote unquote, to the Nazi occupation. Because we look at a map now and that you had documentaries start with, and in 1940, the Germans took out a list of all the countries as if every single country was taken over in the same way, because everyone was different. You're talking about Czechoslovakia. Yes, that's a, you know, that was a the protectorate, then some are occupied, France gets split into two, then there's Norway, then there's Denmark, then there's Poland. And, you know, you could just do a program talking about the different right. um, setups in terms of how the Germans gain their control. And that, that would be interesting. For those who don't know, that would be a really interesting program to break it all down. But, yeah, Norway, particularly fascinating. And, yeah, and Quisling, of course, uh, becomes a name a word for traitor, which in a weird way he'd probably be quite proud of. <laughs> That's the legacy to history that his very name now means traitor. That's kind of means you'll never be forgotten if nothing else. And you know, the other opposite word is Yusing. So Yusing comes from Yusing Fjord, and it was uh, a boat that was carrying a UK uh, soldier, uh, Marine people. They were coming down through the leads. And there we go again. I just lost Janet temporarily. I expect she'll come back in again. But yeah, no. Hopefully, we'll 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 do that in one day. We'll cover we'll cover the, each of the countries and how they came back in, uh, or how they 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 came to be occupied in ninety four. That was back again, Janet. That was a bit of a uh, well, internet blip, blip then. That's okay. So anyway, um, this this thing became, the word became using because um, the Ch Ch Churchill gave the command to go in and rescue everybody, and the 
a Norwegian air turned around. We are using. So that was another word. And so that what's you know, we've got all the coastal places totally tight. You've got the, the German Marine, all these boats, huge battleships are coming up. But in the center, everybody's escaping up through the center. And the thing that I didn't realize years ago is that the Poles, French, and Brits try to come into like the middle of Norway around Molde, try to stop. And this leads to these two books that I found on the shelf because they had maps from the Baedeker from 1927. You can find it online. And that's all they had. They just didn't have good maps. So, and then of course, by the time France fell, even though they fought heroically up in Narvik, everything fell and uh, everybody withdrew. And the king was eventually able to get out, which is very important. The whole cabinet went with him. Yeah, and, and that and that is, is sets the precedent for the how other countries then follow. There was the government in exile and then the Netherlands later on and Czechoslovakia. And it all, as I said, people seem to have, have bitten on the idea of me doing a, show, a week of shows about the occupations in 1940s. So, yeah, we could do the European theatre one show, then we could do the Pacific theatre the next show and go through Singapore and the Philippines. That would be fascinating. But, um, yeah, handing back to you because I'm, I'm enjoying this. Okay, so the next slide shows... Uh... These are uh, next slide shows. This is the devastation that was going on. So Kavan was horrible. And actually my hostess, her last name is Kavan, which is very typical of Norwegian's name. You're often named from where you come from, which used to drive the British crazy on the Shetland bus <laughs> because they'd say, oh, I'm so and so. And then they changed their name because they moved somewhere else for the last name. But Molda got very heavily hit and just going straight up through the middle. I did see a monument. My hostess took me, uh, they took me everywhere and they showed me this really sweet monument uh, dedicated to three kids who tried to stop the Germans. And it was on the way to, to Kavan. We were going to go to their setter. And they're all these, you can find them hidden. So it's over with, uh, this is Trondheim on the Gommel Bridge, very famous bridge there in Trondheim. And this is one of the exhibits that's at the Resistance Museum. So they're under control. So the thing to understand what it was like being an occupied country, you know, uh, Joseph Tarovin was sent over almost immediately. And he was a close personal friend of Norway. Now, why was the interest in Norway? Well, one of the things they worried about the mines that were way at the very top, uh, bordering on uh, Finland. And uh, these mines, nickel mines, they also had mines uh, producing pyrite, all these things. And uh, very soon, the allies down in North Africa, they're going to be cutting off that kind of material. So they really wanted that. They also wanted the fisheries. Um, they sort of forgot, though, that the boats go out in April. And a lot of these huge whalers, they were the first ones to really start becoming part of the resistance on the Atlantic uh, side of the war. So uh, this guy was awful, and uh, he had a personal command of 6,000 people, including the secret police. That's him standing in the middle on the left, and behind him is Jonas Rees, I believe, and he was like second in command. And you can see him also talking um, in the photo with the uh, swastika, and if you look to the right, you can see Quisling standing there in a long... Mm. So uh, this was one of the first uh, talks that he was doing. And yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the resources aspect because this came up in a show I did with Alexander Clark about the fish oil that ended up becoming grease that was used by That's the right. German Kriegsmarine. And, you know, and Norway, I think in some ways, we perceive it as kind of, you know, fields and skiing. But in terms of beyond that, of course, massive great resources uh, uh, and all the naval importance, you know, it was strategically important. And of course, I'm you'll probably touch on it, the idea that the Germans don't see the Norwegians in the subhuman way they see the pole. They, they, so they, 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 there's a sense of connection because, as we know, Hitler's got an interest in, in Viking mythology and history. So he's got a, a bit more respect for the Norwegians. He's, he thinks they, well, he's hoping they'll kind of come in more and go come turn to the sort of German way of thinking. He's not going to get that in Poland. He doesn't want that in Poland places like France, Great Britain, but Norway, he's got this this sort of vested interest in 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 taking over hearts and minds as well as literally, yeah. I think. And it's also part of the myth of you know, sort of the myth of religion of the SS when you get deep that they tried to take the Viking ships out of the museum in Oslo. 
And it was actually local Nazis that stopped them from doing that. So this gives you an idea of what's going on in Norway. You couldn't sing or fly the flag. You were very restricted. And one of the interesting things is that anybody on the North Sea was considered a border. So even being in Bergen, Trondheim, or Stavanger, you had to have this particular pass. It's a Gresson pass. But if you were on the Swedish border, you would have a Gresson pass for that. And then disabilities. Of course, we get all freaked out about that because we know what's going on <clears throat> in Norway. But if you were deaf or you had a limp, you, they really wanted you to, you were imposed to do labor projects. In fact, my friend um, in Trondheim, he was um, forced to work on various projects. And he finally, because he was a, you know, a, journeyman, a journeyman carpenter, and eventually, he, when he finally got out of there, he was supposed to build a building with four wood sides and the fourth was concrete. And uh, that's when he got out. He knew that it was mm -hmm. for executing people. So uh, also, also the country, you know, every kind of radio was collected and banned. You could only listen to certain things. They made a great thing about, you know, gathering books and burning any kind of English books, movie, whatever, uh, American and English, and especially by a Jewish author. Uh, they were burnt and hidden. So people often were burying their books, um, even textbooks. They were trying to issue finally in a couple of years textbooks that, just bring in all this weird science about, you know, people who are not pure into science. And that's when the teachers were gone. And then a spot check, a spot check mm -hmm. is stand up. So here's some ideas. Uh, the the bunker uh, soup and cart, that is from uh, my friend who was working um, near Turpitz. The Turpitz was actually in Trondheim when he was there. And he remembered how it was heavily, heavily guarded when he was on his way to do some particular kind of job. So uh, very important is that there was a 50 mile limit of fishing and you had to have a particular poster in your, your wheelhouse saying that you, you will be put to death. So this fits into the beginning of the Shetland bus coming over. So. Which we'll get to. Yeah. And, and that's the thing that, 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 the, the Norway coast is in terms of Europe probably unique in that sense of just no matter how many if they get the Germans could have millions of troops there you cannot patrol every inch of the Norwegian coast because of the field things like that so immediately people hit on this idea of this can be used for mm -hmm. getting across the uh, the North Sea so I'll, I'll hand back to you yeah, so uh, really on the very first day, people are getting in their boats, they're going to Scotland, the Shetlands, whatever. Uh, one boat ended up in New York City, which played a very important part in a very famous SOE uh, Norway uh, raid. But uh, these were large boats too. So um, the um, Olaf that I'll be talking about in a bit, I think it was 42 feet. And so the Germans, if they could capture any of these, they would try to grab them. They would end up being patrol boats along the coast and put the work that way. But they miss the whalers. <laughs> the whalers are out whaling. So they become part of Nord's ship, which is a very, this is Norway's greatest contribution to the war effort because they made up a huge part of the merchant that's going up to Murmansk and stuff like that. So, and it's interesting that first couple weeks, over 200 refugees and British soldiers, the British soldiers are trapped there because yep. everything failed. So they're getting a, a local fishermen because they know that these Norwegians are ordinary people, but they know the waters and they're helping them to get out. So they help British soldiers get out. And I wanted you to see this because it gives you, you can see how long the coast of Norway is all the way up to the very top into the Arctic Circle. But the Shetland Islands right there is uh, at one point, it's only about 187 miles apart. So they're going to always do it in winter because winters are dark. Uh, you usually ran from about October to as late as April um, and even May. But it's getting risky because the light is getting uh, really risky. And it's rough. So, uh, so they're going back and forth. The Norwegians are taking people over. And finally, uh, British Major Mitchell shows up in, I think his first name was Leslie, showed up in the Shetlands to organize these sh ships that are showing up and to make it a permanent show. And so from then on, it goes. So the first, uh, I hope I have this right, but Lunavo was the first base and it's up there at the top. And um, it, I, if you go look at it on Google Earth, which I use a lot now, it wasn't around when I first started. Yeah. <laughs> it's great, you can kind of go on a little thing and it's very desolate. 
But by 42, they moved down to Scullaway. Now all the uh, all the boats left from Lyric, though. So Lyric, and that, and in Lyric, they actually have a wonderful uh, Shetland bus museum. And every year they have some, uh, you know, come or, they're celebrating the the bus. And there are very few veterans left, but who were a part of that. And they're all volunteers. They are not. They're just fishermen <laughs> that are volunteer, and they're learning how to handle machine guns on the boat and all that. So that's the author right there, which is a very famous, very famous boat. Mm -hmm. So Televogue. Well, where is Televogue? Well, Bergen again. Uh, they're building a major. In the very beginning, they start building a major U-boat pens there, and they'll continue building them in 1942, and. Um, so Televogue is on this island called Sutra, Sutra, and it has two parts. The northern part is Sund, which they're like divided into districts. Uh, but it was off the beaten path. And, you know, I was writing this dramatic scene in my new book that I'm working on, which takes place, starts in Televogue. Um, I, I had this dramatic scene. Well, they had no cars, so I had to completely rewrite it. They had no cars except in Fell. In Fell, um, that's where it will come into play that... It had, um, they had one car there, they said, called the Plum. It was a purple taxi. But there are, there are also, uh, the Stapo is there and more official Germans. But they they put a road to Televogue uh, in the 1930s. So you always went by boat. But, so no one's there. You can just kind of come in there and go on to the next one. So this gives you an idea of what it looked like. This is, this is a... What you're looking at on the uh, right is the um, east side of this very long uh, fjord, and we'll see a picture of it in a minute. But uh, so from May 40 to 42, the estimate is around 136 to 500. I've seen 150. They're going back and forth, and uh, they're not always the agents that are coming in SOE. It's actually people, you know, like a book called, uh, there's a boat called the Anna. That took a bunch of people over, and Anna probably came back. And I don't, it didn't look like it was official, um, but it's taking people over. So they're kind of doing their own thing there. And uh, here's an example of refugees coming over. Often they were people that they were in trouble. Sometimes they're in trouble with the Gestapo, uh, or they were uh, several Jewish people left that way. Uh, they had a very small Jewish um, community, and uh, I, as high as 2,000. It's very, very small. But a lot of them taught at the university. They were doctors um, and so on. So they tr they did try to help people get out. Okay. So um, I have other pictures of Loritz and Marta, but this is their son, uh, Lars. Oh, he got married in the 1930s. So when you look at the this place, you see how rocky it is. And the house that you see right in the middle uh, is the Lawrence house. And this is where uh, Lawrence and his wife would hide uh, their, their, these agents that were coming over. So they're definitely in, involved with the Shetland bus tra traffic that's coming over. And uh, so they would hide there. Another person involved was Joseph Urutwit and Carl Niepen. They were also involved. Uh, Lars's house was not right there. It's a little further away around. And we can go look at the next slide. So I wanted to talk about this because 1940 year, the no Norwegians call it the merciless year. Everything that's, a lot of the resistance organizations were kind of like organic. Let's get together and let's, uh, let's do something and maybe we'll eventually get trained or something will happen. And during this time period, the Gestapo is trying to get, they're getting kind of annoyed because they're not, there are people that are Nazis. They belong to the National Sammling. They are working with the Germans. But there are people that are not working with the Germans. And they're getting kind of a little up. One of the first things that happened in February was the teacher strike. Quisling wanted mandated both in the churches and the schools they would have certain curriculum. And finally, the teachers wrote up a letter and they said they would refuse to do this. So a, a thousand male teachers were sent to Greeny. Greeny was the first concentration camp outside of Oslo. And they were sent there. And eventually, because they were still resisting, they sent 499 up to Schirkenes. 
and they did hard labor. And it, it took a while for the word to get out, but once the world found out, I think Sweden finally, something was snuck to Sweden and they reported what's going on. So they did come back. But the next thing that happened that very same month up in the Walla group, now this is Ulusan, which is up the coast. And uh, they also had a very steady traffic to the Shetland Islands. And uh, Oliver Henry Oliver Brennan was a Norwegian. He was barely five feet tall and he was with the Gestapo. He had the most effective group that the Gestapo in Trondheim depended on him. And this was his first effort of getting what he called negative agents and his own people into this group of refugees. They were mostly young boys. They were just, as far as I know, I don't think there were any females in the group. But they were like, you know, 20, 21. Because um, uh, that's one of the interesting things about 1942, because you look at the resistance groups and the and the burgeoning sort of SOE networks. In 41, the Allies are kind of setting things up and it's all kind of working quite well. And then German counterintelligence steps up their game across Europe and they start infiltrating. So you see that in France, you see it in Czechoslovakia, you see it across Europe, is the Germans just start planting their guys in. And of course, with a, with a, how do you check who is who? If you've got someone coming to you claiming they are escaping from this, no one in this situation has paperwork. How do you prove who you are or aren't who you are? So it's fascinating that the 42 is, and then it continues even to 43, is, is the, we talk about the happy time in terms of German Kriegsmarine and what they're doing in the Atlantic, but there's kind of a happy time in, some, in terms of Germans now breaking into um, established networks that have been working quite well. So it's key. It, it is fascinating how often 42 is the year the first um, faults start to appear, so to speak. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, there's more happening at this. This, this whole year is horrible because uh, it'll result in uh, 10 prominent people in Trondheim being killed. And that became a war crime because they were not put on trial. And uh, mm. they're still looking for the bodies in the Trondheim Fjord. But uh, that was a huge, and Terboven, you'll see what happens with Terboven with the televote. So this is actually, this is called the Carfjorden. And so if you look straight out, you're looking into the North Sea. And uh, boats will come in here. This is both, of the herring runs here, cod runs out there. And uh, early times, they actually hunted the minke uh, whale, I read. But mostly it's the herring industry, which is important to the Germans, because that's where you get glycerin. You get those important pieces from the fish products. Uh, anyway, so you come into the fjord. And if you look in the next picture, this is from you know Google Earth. So there's a core fjord. But the boat could continue on up to the end. And um, if you, this is the modern day bridge, but generally the road was put in in the 30s. But when you got to the edge of the east side, you would have to ask someone to row you over. And uh, the Tella family is just above uh, the bridge, maybe just on the map, a little bit above there. And then the other families were further down. So I understand that the east side is called Nipo. And so sometimes you see the name Nippon, which sometimes means a person from Nippo. But the main town was over uh, Televo. So this is fun. Um, this is an actual uh, strip from Asui, Norway, meaning the Shetland bus, showing the arrival of the Olaf. And uh, it came, left the islands in, uh, so you can read, if you can see it, you can see that it says where it's coming from. The, uh, the group code name is Anchor. So that's on the left side of the chart. And then that's the anchor. And then it's saying where it's going. It's dropping one person off and then it returns and they say that it's, uh, there we go. So now you can see that they, uh, they drop, they're going, the area is Bergen. That's when they arrived, when they came back. They have the skipper on there. They have the Olaf. And at the very end, when you go there, you'll see that it was successful mm -hmm. operation. However, they arrived, uh, they were going to drop him off at Marstein, uh, Lighthouse, and I tried to find it on Google Earth. I couldn't find it, but that's a picture of it. I believe it's just slightly north of the opening to Course Fjorden. And they were originally going to go there, but when they got there, it, the description says that there's this blinding light. And they were trying, well, what the heck is going on? And then they can kind of see behind the light because the lighthouses are off. 
they don't turn them on because of you know Allied bombing, but and they're all controlled by German authorities. But the light was on, and then they can see kind of underneath it these huge e-boats and these other you know large boats that are well they're protecting these two ships and Guinness now I think is how I pronounce and the Prince Egan and they were being escorted to Bergen. So they kind of cautious, you know, cautiously left to go down the course of the Orden, but a trawler broke out and started following them. So these are fishing boats. And part of even though by this time they're putting on big Colt machine guns, they have a lot of nets. And uh, they they look like they're all geared out to go fishing. So they've come over, they've busted through that 50 line. And so they were able to drop him off. And they dropped off Gulbenson. And he's going to show up later in a crazy thing I only found out about a year ago. <laughs> I'm just going to jump in and say something now because um, my, for you people know I live in Normandy. And for those who've been to Normandy, a lot of your viewers have been there. The German guns at the gun battery at Long Sommer, which are just only about 10 miles away from my house, they were former guns off the guys now. However you say that, I'm not getting my German. So there's a, there's a connection with that German ship here in Normandy. The guns there are when it got upgraded at, at some point during the war. So I think the guns we've got here in Normandy were on the ship when it was there in 42, I think. Maybe not. Anyway, they're, they're guns off that ship. So that, that And this connects, of course, with what... Um, uh, Brian uh, Brian Walter and um, Ian Ballantyne were talking about recently with the Bismarck and and uh, Trapitz and all that importance of Norway for the Germans for their capital ships. So, but that's a, we, we digress as usual. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> anyway, so that's that's what happened. So, how does uh, how does our disaster week happen in uh, Televog? So, there's a couple of stories. The old story I heard is a woman got really upset because some people got some brat. They brought over real coffee, maybe some sugar. Tobacco, Virginia tobacco was highly, <laughs> but you had to be careful when you smoked it because you, it would be a complete giveaway. But anyway, the, 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 the story that the museum says in Televoke, and it seems the correct one, is that there was a dispute over a boat that Lawrence tell us, they don't name the man, but they, he sold him a boat. And, and not long after it sunk out off there in the North Sea and he was able to get back and then I think to raise it, but, uh, it was damaged and he was fighting over the insurance. So he kept going to him and said, you know, you sold me this boat. And it's sort of like, and you know, that was your problem. You're, you know, it was a fine boat, you know. So finally the guy got upset and he got on his bike because they had no cars and he went up to Fell. And you can see Fell, I have a little arrow pointing to it on the map. So you see Televogue. Uh, I was, one of the interpretations, I have a friend, um, you know, translate some things for me. It looked like it was about, I don't know, 22 meters up there. It, it seems longer than that, but I, that's about two and 12 and a half miles. That doesn't seem right to me. But anyway, he went up there and he complained and he was talking to the Nazi sheriff, Perli, and he said, yeah, it's your problem, blah, blah, blah. So finally he went back a couple of times and finally said, look, the guy has an illegal radio. And then he finally said, you know, I think English are coming there. So uh, Joachim Bjorgen was a member of Stapo. So that is the Nazi Norwegian um, fleet. Oh. And actually the bigger picture, he's under a breast, but oh. this is a nice shot of him. And he, he finally decides, he came over, he went to see Fell. He's given permission uh, from higher ups that he can go and just check on it. So he, he gets a fishing pole and he rides his bike down to Televoke. And the funny thing in the story is, uh, you know, one of the men who met him, you know, like, well, where are you from? And, you know, what are you doing here? He's, and he said, you're going fish. And it just started this conversation. So they thought he was English because he had a rucksack. And that shows that the people in the village knew what was going on. The other thing I wanted to say, uh, people could identify the boats coming in because uh, one man reported said, yeah, I knew you brought that boat in February because the boats went tonk, ka tonk, ka tonk, ka tonk. These are Mori, uh, these big Mori uh, boats. And that's the ones that the, the, um, they use in the Shetland boats. They're very sturdy fishing boats. But it has a sound. But people could recognize how that tonk, ka tonk went on a particular ship. And so... Um, they're used to they're used to English people showing up, you know, with their rucksacks, and so uh, he said he said yeah he's thinking about you know looking you want to go to Skangen you missed the boat, and I had just left a couple of days before, so um, 
all next thing he knew, he's invited over to meet Lawrence. And uh, it's totally crazy because uh, what he didn't know, he went back and reported because he heard people upstairs. Uh, and um, so he, he came back and reported. And what he didn't know is that these were Linka company agents. These were not just casual Englishmen coming over for whatever reason. They were highly trained people and they brought ammunition, weapons and explosives with them. Their goal was to keep working their way <clears throat> into the interior. And so they were hiding upstairs along with the 14-year-old Uga. Telly was with them. <clears throat> so he didn't know. So on his advice, uh, you can see this again is the layout for uh, the boat coming over. <clears throat> and they dropped off the agents. And um, uh, the far list, you can see they're actually this one. They're listing all the uh, stuff that they're um, they brought with them. They brought Sten guns and all kinds of stuff on the trip. It's really fun to actually see something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, the SOE uh, log books. So it's kind of fun. And, and I'll then, you just to jump in again. No you way. can kind of see a confidence building in these people. You know, the fact they kind of recognize the ships, they recognize people are coming with rucksacks. And it, it's it, in, in writing terms, you know, you can, if this was a movie, you could see that something bad's going to happen. You can see that it's only a matter of time before the Nazis discover this because they're not idiots. You know, as we talked about yesterday with Heydrich in Czechoslovakia, there are some very clever people working for the Germans, evil, but very, very clever. And this sort of brazen, willful, you know, everyone knows the coast, you know, they call it a border. They run, it, it's, it's, the, the scene is being set for an impending disaster, unfortunately, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, and there, there were incidents prior to this where ships were lost, one boat sank, it was attacked, because the air attack would come all the way off of <clears throat> Norway, and even one time I think they attacked Lervik. But anyway, so, <clears throat> so they, he doesn't know that. So the next day, <clears throat> it's the next slide, we'll see that um, the next day, 4 a.m. in the morning. He always seemed to like attack at 4 or 5 in the morning. Um, Behrens, Johann Behrens and his uh, commander, Gerard Bertram, arrived by boat with 10 other German officers. It's some NS, that's National Sommelin. They surround the house. They have this fight out because, again, they're surprised. They don't know these guys have small arms. And uh, Arne Verum is killed, but Emil Havel was seriously wounded. And uh, people, one account says, you know, we're so... Uh, we heard something happening. We didn't know what was going on. We saw all these boats, but a lot of them left. They, a couple of members of the village are actually over there and they hid, they left and they were saved from the village. So that night <clears throat> they grabbed all these people and they took them to Bergen for inter interrogation and torture. Lawrence, his wife, Marta, and their youngest son, Aga. So this Aga went with them, this little 14 year old kid. And I've heard him in an interview. He's now in his eighties. Um, talking about what happened because he was right in the room when this fight was going on. In fact, a bullet went right past his head. And uh, that night, all the men were put in the barn and the women and children ages four months to 97 were put in the youth center. And see, what's interesting about this, having seen the talk about legacy, you can try to see how this pattern, what the Germans are starting to do, and <clears throat> this is like, that's why it got its name later on. The men were talking among themselves. They, they had no idea what was going on, but they felt like, oh boy, we may not make it out. And this is a shock to Norwegians. There were incidents around the country of, you know, sabotage and people being rounded up, you know, for, but not like a whole village being put. Well, and this brings us up this idea of the Germans not treating countries by exactly the same rules, you know, that they, they have a, a different attitude in Czechoslovakia than they do in Norway. So they're, they're perhaps giving the Norwegians a little bit more um, room for maneuver because they're allowing a little bit more trust at the beginning because they think they've got a bit more mutual respect, whereas other countries there, you know, in Czechoslovakia, notably yesterday, they're, they're clamping down very, very um, strongly at the beginning. It, it's, it's a fascinating insight into how the German war machine, that, as we remember those who watched it when Dr. Philip Blood Dis disassembled the, the SS and how it ran, yeah. which is, for my mind, one of the best programs we've ever done on World War II TV and has been borne out by the number of views it's had, just how incredibly efficient 
that mm -hmm. German machinery machine was at, at, at instigating, controlling, and organizing mass evil. I say, I, I suppose is what you'd call it. So yeah, it's um, yeah, fascinating stuff. Uh, eerily ha and 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 but and macabre, uh, fa fascinating though. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, <clears throat> so what happened is Terboven heard about this and apparently he was personal friends with Behrens and Bertram. So he just went crazy. He got permission from uh, Hitler to go ahead and he decided we're just going to wipe them from the earth. And it doesn't that have a similar ring to the other things that, you know, mm -hmm. I've been to the French site. That's very moving. Uh, it's powerful. No one talks when you walk through that place. Yeah. But uh, so it's an interesting like this is like I think this is the first instance where the Germans actually did something like this, like wiping out a village. It's going to have a different type of outcome, not like the horrible things that happened in Czechoslovakia and France. But he came and you can see him in he's wearing the sunglasses on the left in the one picture. And you can see him. Um, that's him right there. And I think there's some. It's mostly Gestapo. Looks like there's some Marine people off the big e-boats that came. Yeah. And they're planning on, you know, what they're going to do next. And he came personally to see its destruction. So the next day, same day, because he's there April 3rd, 3rd. So all this time, everybody's isolated. The women are in one plot. The men, you know, they don't know what's going on. But again, this weird thing, and you 16 to 60 seem to be this rule about what you're going to do with people. So all the men that were, you know, the teenagers all the way to 60 year olds were arrested and sent away to Barrack. And by the way, um, Teller, uh, Lawrence Teller was 63. He's already in Barragan. And I think two others uh, also uh, go to in this group. So they were sent to Greeny and then they were sent to Sachsenhausen. And 72 were deported to Germany and 31 of them died in the camps. Uh, it's interesting that Lawrence Tiller and um, Yusuf Overtweet, they stay at Greeny the whole time. And then uh, what, what's kind of scary is that all these arrested people, they, they were named NN, you know, knock novel prisoners, and they disappeared sometime. And they don't, I don't think they ever found their bodies. And then Tiller and the, um, Lawrence Tiller and Hubble, they'll be executed in 1943. And the weird thing, the, that first boat that uh, got captured up in Allison, they decided, well, we'll just throw in some extra people. So they took 18 of those young men and they executed them uh, as part of the reprisal. So it's, they grabbed people they were happening, you know, doing the traffic with Tullivog and they're going after Allison because that was an important place for the Shetland bus. And it is fascinating again that they, um, these these stories all connect the dots, you know, because you see when you start to understand the connect the, the, the different histories, you can see that they get a precedent set there. So it becomes well, it's okay, we did it there, so we can do it again. Because you get Operation Freshman in November '42, I think it was, where the British commander was going in by glider, airborne force engineers to to blow up the Telemark plant, and that some of that one of the gliders gets captured by the Germans. They're all executed. So you can see the once it becomes accepted once. Then, you get, then there's that precedent. Okay, well, we can do it again then. And and it, it's it's as you say, you can see this development, a progression of, of it, it's like like serial killers. You know that that the first one is always the the hardest, and then it becomes easier and easier and easier. And you can justify it. You can justify it within the way the SS and the Gestapo works, the organization. So well, we did it before, and then you, then you just crank up the scale each time. You know, you just go from it being ten to twenty to thirty to to, as we talked about yesterday, it's 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 it is truly fascinating how grim this subject is. But yet also, it, you you want to know more. You, it, you, I'm intrigued to find out more. It's it's really enthralling. This. Yeah, and you know one uh, one thing that's going on too is that one of the uh, articles I had translated, which was published probably about 15 years ago, one of the people who wrote it was a young person, and. Uh, he said that the um, they had regular Vermont there too, and that they were crying, they were appalled. But then you have the SS SD troops there, and they do what they do. So, 
Anyway, this is what's interesting, the Lydice of the North. So these are pictures, um, they belong to the North Sea Traffic Museum in Tel Aviv, which is a great museum. It's on my list. I hope I can go next year. But uh, they don't really know who took the picture. Mostly Germans took the picture. But the interesting thing is this name didn't happen until in summertime. So it's after, uh, I think the word for Lydice got out pretty early, do you think? Did it? Get up yeah, the Germans gave out themselves. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But it, this did not get out until about June or July, and I think uh, I think it got picked up by the Swedish press first, and then the New York Times published it. And I think the New York Times in America were the ones that gave it this name because by then they saw the horror of Lydice, and it's happening in like we thought Norway was, you know not bad things happen there. In fact, the Swedes used to complain to agents coming over and say, it's not so bad. Why are you complaining? You know, they, the Swedes didn't get what was going on. Anyway, that's how I got its name. Yeah, and it is fascinating, again, that, that it happened before. But, you know, the, as I say, the, the information getting to the public and, and the, the net, you know, that's we forget that. We talked about that yesterday in, in the, uh, that, uh, you know, the Allies aren't, a, well, some of the people at home, Homeland USA aren't aware of the Holocaust yet. And so the t we know that the timeline of the events happening isn't necessarily the timeline of when the, the greater world got to hear about them. So there are there are two separate timelines. And uh, like 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 um, um, Kati, the Katyn massacre of 1940, that wasn't 41, was, was that 40? People didn't know about that in some cases for years. So, so the order at which the massacres occur does not necessarily relate to the order that the public hear about them. It's, it's yeah, fascinating. Even in your own country, because there was a massacre in 42 of Russian and Yugoslav prisoners way up north uh, by the herd. These are members of the uh, National Sombling. Um, so that people didn't know about that until just a few years ago. They're finally talking about it because it's happened and Norwegians were involved with that. Anyway, so back to the story. So uh, the women are left there. Um, they, I think the Germans made really sure that you got to see the place all blown up. And uh, they're hearing these sounds. They put them on boats and they sent them off to a place that's south of Bergen. So if I don't know if you could blow up the map a little bit, because when you get getting to, so you, ha you leave Tel Aviv, and you go out and then you have to cut this fjord there. This, uh, this is how the big German boats. So the one that's to the left, the Runa Fjorden, that's one of the routes into Berg. It's really complicated. These huge battleships are going up through this very narrow thing. There's one to come from the top and one through the bottom. But anyway, they end up in Bergen. And then the road down to Fauna is... Uh, uh, according to my spy book, it was partially graveled and it had um, as asphalt. And they were sent down to this school uh, in Fauna. And we can see what it looks like. It was called Storvit. And uh, this is their first night uh, sleeping in the gym. And they're all there with all their children from the four-month-old uh, to the 97-year-old. Uh, but they just, they didn't know what was going on. You know, where... They didn't know where their husbands and sons were. It, I don't. I'm, you know, I'm mother of four sons, and I, I just couldn't imagine anything like this. You know, at least my kids are with me. But what's going to happen? It must have been horrific. And that's what the school looked like in uh, about 1939. So they were sent there, but within a couple of weeks. So they're they're there about May 2nd, but in a couple of weeks, they sent all the elderly. And some of these women were bedridden. Some of them hadn't been out of bed in years. You know, no town. They probably had a doctor, but, you know, it's all kind of country. And so they're sent way over to the Hardanger area to a place called Framas in Ulden School. And that's, um, it's, it sounds like it was also a place where you could do um, trade learning too, but it was a school for older kids. And, and then all of a sudden they, German authority said, you know, uh, we're going to take you all there, but you're with those of you that have kids under six, but you're going to leave the older kids at Storovit. And that again must have been horrific 
And so you know, the women are put on buses. Sometimes the Red Cross is there. The Norwegian Red Cross was allowed to be there, which again, you know, this is not happening in Lydice and these other places. Mm -hmm. So it kind of shows this difference. And maybe it's uh, maybe it's uh, not a marketing, but maybe a propaganda thing that, you know, you, you don't want the good word to get out, what we're doing. But at the same time, they're kind of still not being too awful. Yeah. So, if I may, uh, yeah, if the Norwegian Red Cross are being allowed access, what are these, the women and children being told their situation is? I mean, are they told they are political prisoners? Are they told they're being held in terms of reprisal? Are they are they terrorists? I mean, you know, if you're if you're trying someone, you have to be acute. You have to have charges brought against you. So, I mean, what what are they being told is their crime, uh, quote unquote? I think their crime is for harboring um, these English agents. That's their yeah. crime. There was never any trial. And this is what Terboven did. He, he literally flattened the village. There's a picture of it. You can hardly figure out where the rubble is and what was a building. They killed all the cows. They blew up all the boats. They made sure that no one would ever, that's what Terboven wanted. They would never, ever come back to this place. This was the lesson. They were going to, and of course, like life see, it kind of backfired once people start mm -hmm. hearing about it. So, uh, and this again, this is where the school is located. It looks quite lovely, and actually, uh, you know, it wasn't difficult there, but um, but during that first fall, it's the winter and the fall of '42. They're starting to hear that their husbands and sons are dying. They're dying. The dysentery was running, but there are some accounts that I've watched. Uh, there were actually some people were murdered in the camps. And I don't know if there was the ones that were, you know, designated NN. You know, there, it was definitely a work camp where you work to death. But uh, the other thing this, you know, even that first year, but again, the Red Cross was eventually allowed to come there. But again, so the kids are down at the other, they're at the school. And uh, so this is a group of the boys there. And uh, during the, uh, this thing, they began to hear rumors that the Germans planned to separate the mothers and send the children. So the mothers of the, so I don't know what happened. If you had a kid that was over the age of six, but you had a two-year-old, I don't know what you did. But maybe you hope that your neighbor would look after your kids if you're going with the, the younger, younger child. Um, <clears throat> but they got this, this rumor was going that they were, they were going to be sent to orphanages in southern Norway. And of course, again, these are Aryan kids, highly desirable. And we already know that the Nazis were kidnapping kids from all over because they had the right look or something like that. So they're supposed to go to southern Norway, which would be Oslo and you know, down that area. But they started getting rumors they might be sent to Oslo, Germany. So this is a story that I just found about a year ago. So the, the North Sea Traffic Museum in Tel Aviv, which tells this story, I uh, did a I did a presentation on him. So Conrad Elias Birkog, uh, he was in from Bergen and he went to the U.S. and he studied medical at uh, John Hopkins University, which is top university in this time period, and he became a, a bacteriologist and then he studied the Pasteur in Paris. Uh, and then he came back to Bergen. So in the war, he became the leader of the Red Cross. And he often was down there interacting with the kids and the mothers at Storovit. And when they heard this rumor, which he believed to be true, he did something. And the, uh, the article about it is very interesting because he knew it was unethical. But he knew all the kids who had their diphtheria shots. And he picked out kids that had the shot and gave them diphtheria. And this was, you know, if he, uh, this, this was so dangerous. He was confident because he was an expert that they would not get really sick and die. In fact, the, they were vaccinated. They might show symptoms, but they're not going to die. But if he had been caught, every medical person working with him, like the nurses, in on it, they would all be shot. Mm. But uh, this is the other thing that's so fascinating about the Germans. They were so freaked out about germs. And I keep, this, this happened in other places too in Europe, 
but they freaked out when they saw these kids, you know, with these symptoms, and they were deathly afraid of diphtheria. So eventually, the doctor won, and they all went to Framus. But it's a crazy story. I mean, that's incredibly brave on his part. I mean, incredible. I mean, risky. If that backfires. Not only is he in trouble, I mean, he'd be tortured for the rest of his life. If he ended up killing, I know his motivation is to try and save kids, but if he ends up killing a couple of kids whilst trying to save them, I mean, it's all, all sorts of ethical questions coming up there and moral questions, absolutely extraordinary. And this story was not known until recently. Uh, he did write his own book though, but I don't know if he wrote about that, but he published that in the wow. 50s, I think. So they all ended up in Framnitz. They're all here together. And this is where they will stay for the time that they're released. It's incredible. So I gotta throw this in because this is also something new that I learned. I was asked to give a talk uh, to talk about the resistance. I belong to the Sons of Norway in Washington, DC. And one of the members talked about her Bombardi family. They were of Italian descent. They were a couple of generations there in Oslo but they were hiding agents uh, in uh, around their area and they were found out. And so I, they asked me, could you look into this and do the context around this? Well, they were talking about the Horton gang and I'm very curious. I didn't know who the Horton gang was. So I contacted my friend, Bob Pearson in UK and he said, okay, this is this. Well, uh, in part of the story, this name popped up by the name of Tor Store or Store Tor um, and uh, that was his name. And uh, at the time, uh, he, they said he was tortured. He gave up information. It ended up uh, the aunt of Barbati, she was uh, going to nursing school in Drummond. And so all these people were, everything happened to them. The fa her father ended up in Greeny along with his, his sister stayed at Greeny, then her father and uncle were sent to Schatzenhausen too. So he was there as well. And so the story was, well, he, he got shot quite badly, but it turns out that he was leading, when he arrived on that near miss with the Marstein Lighthouse, he was actually the leader operation anchor. And he was supposed to go to Drammen and, well, beyond Drammen, the, the Horton area is, East, it's west of, uh, it's quite mountainous, but it's important thing is the Royal Marine um, Center was there. The Germans took it over. This is where they built the boats. This is where the Royal Navy was. They took it over. And this Horton group was working around there. And so uh, they were found out and uh, they, all of them ended up in Schatzenhausen. So from this one thing giving up, it turns out he turned into a double agent. It's just crazy. And uh, my friend there at um, Televog, he said this, he was allowed to go back and become an instructor. Wow. I mean, it's, stuff. it's just blows your head. It, I, and I just found this out probably about three months ago. So they were all sent to Schatzenhausen. It was very, very hard. They did have uh, Swedish Red Cross uh, packages and there's stories of them secretly sharing it with you know, friends that might be from a different country to make sure, because the Danes got it too. There were Danes and Norwegians then. So when liberation happened, the women were sent, uh, they were released in 44, it doesn't say, I don't know the exact date. And they moved back to Sotra, they moved back to the southern part of Sotra and Sund, but they did not, they were not allowed to go to Telvo because the Germans are still in charge. And there was nothing there anyway. There was nothing, period, there. But on the uh, men's side, uh, Folk Bernadotte, uh, he worked a lot with the Danes and the Norwegians. I, there, I don't think there are very many Swedes there. But he worked with Himmler, and they were able to get all the prisoners out before the uh, place was actually liberated. And they, the Swedish Red Cross ran this, and the white buses, so many different accounts talk about the white buses. They're really... Uh, Red Cross, and they loaded the men on there along with many others. Uh, Green, uh, at Greeny, T uh, Lawrence Teller was released uh, right after. Liberation Day, people don't realize, is May 8th. And the interesting thing, there were still 360,000 soldiers at Liberation, plus about 40,000, maybe more, Russian 
and Polish POWs in the far north. The we read, you know, the post war war is we don't understand that either. We have so many people moved around in the wrong place. How do you identify people? It's just I can't imagine it like that. But well, I mean, the, the British First Airborne Division, you know, recovered from Arnhem, went to Norway at the very end of the war. There was lots of British troops because there was just so much stuff to sort out, sort out, and policing and organisation. We had Claire, of course, on a few weeks ago to about displacement camps. It's not quite a the situation in Norway particularly, but just that post-war getting things back to a level playing field. It was a, a monstrously a, a complicated a effort. And uh, yeah, and, and worth discussing in a future show, I think. Yeah, so they're all reunited, you know. I've seen pictures of the arms. It's like five. It's amazing. They're stacked like seven feet tall. And uh, actually, the Americans wanted, wanted them. Or I think, no, the British wanted them, but they wanted them destroyed. Norway wanted them destroyed. Or British, I can't remember. Maybe mm. the other way around that the British wanted them, and they they wanted them for themselves. Anyway, so after the war, uh, there was nothing there. So, but it became this major thing, uh, this center of you know we need to do something because this is a symbol of people resisting. These are ordinary people who were doing this work, and this is what happened to them. So. They, it took them about four years to uh, get everything built, but they actually had the state um, architecture of Norway. He was one of the people that designed it, and they rebuilt everything. So all the homes, and most of the people moved back, but you have to understand that first, you know, first six months, many of the men died, and that was the problem. There were so many women that had no husbands or elderly women that had no sons to take care of them. So it was awful. So I was always intrigued by the poetry that was read on uh, the BBC. They were on their BBC channel. They were um, Nordal Grieg, who was the nephew of the composer. He was an RAF, I think, uh, flyer. He was eventually shot down. He wrote many poems, but this was written after the war. And it's so beautiful. It's a very long poem, but this is like the last one. It's just, so this is a memorial. You, uh, this is after it's put up. I think it was put up in 49. And you can see it. It's near the museum. But this poem really shows, it said, my life turns to memories, all my thoughts are gone, but one thing is burned into me, this we could never done, just out of hatred, take a child from its mother, butcher 60 cows for one dead soldier, plus all the fishing boats, take an old man and kill him with torture that drives you mad, burn down poor people's houses, all they ever had. And there's one more. When the prison boat pulled away, everything the children got is deep in them to stay, Behind the seductive face, the traitor's outstretched hand. They will see in the glimpse of their dead father and tell a vogue that burned. In these whispers of children, the dream takes on its power. And our Norway lives, awaiting its hour. Very powerful. Yeah. And that's what it looks like today uh, on the Google Earth. <laughs> So I am hoping to go, and I really thank jo Joachim uh, Guslan. He's the curator there at the uh, North Sea Museum. Well, I hope you get there because um, Michael. It, it, well, I hope to get there. Well, and I, I, my, when you were talking there, my my thoughts turned essentially to this age-old debate about resistance and collaboration. We've got Chris Millington coming on in a uh, ten days' time or so, talking about France and and the occupation and Vichy and what have you. And he said, "You said you were there as a student, and you know when when." It's very easy for people to say about various countries, Norway, France, whatever, why didn't more people resist? And this is the kind of story that, although didn't happen all the time, reminds you what can happen by just... And most of the people in this village were not actively resisting. They were passively resisting by being aware of something happening that they weren't doing anything to stop. They weren't going to the Nazis and reporting it, but they were aware of it. And because of that, an entire village gets destroyed. So that these these are the risks that are you in, uh, you undertake if you end up being a resistant. And the difference is if you're an American serviceman or British serviceman or any other country, and you go overseas or woman for your country, your family is safe back home generally. I think there's bombing and things like that. But you know, the, anyone from Chicago who's overseas in the ETO and the Pacific, their wife and mother and father are fine. In the situation where you're occupied, as in Norway, and you decide you want to do something, like you want to be part of the Shetland bus operation, you're not just risking your life. You're not risking the life 
of your mother, your father, your kids, your cousins, your neighbors, and everybody else. And that's that's the thing I think people need to be reminded as, as, as much as the, the disaster itself and the tragedy, and it's not quite this, the horrible out outcome of Orador, so glad it's not that dramatic, but it's that realization to all of us that to be in a country that was occupied involves lots and lots of very, very compli complicated decisions you have to make that are not just affecting you, but they're affecting everybody else you know. Yeah, and the, the interesting thing is, well, the thing is that if the son disappears, you take the father. If the father disappears, you take the son. So one of the men I interviewed, the one from Trondheim, when he saw that he was going to have to build this uh, thing with a concrete wall, three wooden walls, um, he decided to leave. So he, if he left, his father was the main conductor on the train that went from Trondheim to Sweden. That's where all the German soldiers went on leave. And so if he left, his father would be arrested. So he planned to go enroll in school down near Oslo. And he went down there, attended for two weeks, and then started what he said, going east. They call it going east to go to Sweden. And his story almost stopped me writing my novel because he said he kept going and then he got lost in a fog and he was going, it was this border that could have guards and he could be shot, but he got turned around, was heading back into Norway and he was freezing to death. And finally someone turned him around. So you go this way, but his story was so harrowing. I don't think his father got in trouble because the record said he was down. This is in 45. So when he left, so things are falling apart in Norway and Germans are trying to get the soldiers back to the continent. And so they didn't pay attention to the father. But, and again, um, this brings up the idea, thank you for that, of the, of the different timelines in that when Sophie Poldermans was on a few weeks ago talking about the, the, the Dutch girls there, you know, the Germans were still killing agents in you know, March and April 1945. Yeah. And you think... But the writings on the wall, guys, you've lost the war now. You know, it, it's, it is, it's grim looking at how um, dedicated to their evil some of these Germans were till very, very, very late in the game when everything was collapsing. Around. And yet some of the German SS guys are, you know, famously some of the generals like Kurt Meyer and Normandy going off and trying to escape as enlisted men and, get, and, and pretending it's, it, it wasn't them and, the, the t again, the timeline is not the same. As you go across the world, the, 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 where one country is all it's all over now, another country is still still right deep in it. And um, yeah, well, well, I think this has been an absolutely fascinating insight into into not just this particular story, but Norway generally. It just made me realise again that I need to tackle that Norwegian subject. It's there's a lot of a lot of elements there that that, that need bringing together. Um, in terms, just to conclude things, how many of the the SS responsible of this were ever convicted of this? Well, well, uh, Turboven shot himself, so and so did Good. Reed, I yep. think. Yeah, but uh, they had something called the legal purge. One of the things they were very active, they uh, got people to identify the people that are trying to be regular Vermont because they had a different, you know, they were processing the Vermont, having them back over. But uh, I think in Bergen, a couple of people were executed. They were, uh, but in Trondheim, they had at least two people that were. Um, yeah, see what was his name? I can't remember his name, but he originally was down in uh, in Bergen, but he was the head of SS, and he treated their. They had a conservation uh, camp up there called Falstad, and I got a chance to go there and talk about. I mean, it breaks your heart. It's now a peace center, but uh, the people who were held there were forced labor. But my host took me to the forest, and they. This is where they killed Russian and Polish. There were a few American uh, Brits. But on there, but you have these huge, beautiful forests, and they have these huge triangular mo monuments. And there's probably 24 bodies that were under there. And you walk through there again, it's like going to other places, it's silent. Mm -hmm. And after time, you're picking up pine cones and putting it on the you know, on the thing. So and this is where, as well, to interrupt you there, that you know, you read about the the, the very worst goings on in, for example, Poland and and death, you know, proper absolute death camps and Sobibor and what have you. Is that then you can look at country like Norway? Well, the concentration camps there weren't quite as bad as in Poland. Well, maybe not, but that doesn't make it any less shit for the people who are there. That's like you know, that comparing 
um, knife crime to, to gun crime or, or, or sexual assault to rape or rape and murder. Anything bad that happens to you is bad. It doesn't comparing it to someone else's experience does nobody any good at all. Oh well, the poor poor poles had it worse. Yeah, maybe they did. Well, they, they absolutely they did. But that doesn't lessen the experience of these Norwegian people. And having their story being told, I think, is important. And be that normally through your medium of historical fiction, who are people who are perhaps reading books about a variety of subjects, who then get your book and 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 find something out about World War Two that they perhaps wouldn't have watched my channel, for example, they do read fiction. And again, people who, who, who watch YouTube, who don't buy, read books, it's the, it, we're, we're, we're fighting on a, on a combined front. You know, we're, we're all after the same intention, which is to, to educate whilst at the same time kind of entertaining people as well. I like to think people enjoy watching my shows, even though the subject can be quite grim because you're learning and, in, and learning something is an enjoyable process. It's educating, isn't it? So it's all, Good stuff. Anyway, we'll bring things in. It's been fascinating talking to you, Janet. So I'll just remind people what we've got coming up, and I'll come back and say goodbye in a minute. So one more show, Tragedies and Disasters Week, tomorrow evening. Gregory Freeman's coming on, talking about the loss of a B-24 crew in Germany, which is another horrific story. Um, we'll do that tomorrow. Then next week, we're off to South Asia for South Asian History Week. There's some really great shows coming up. Watch for the times of day next week, because with a time difference, people joining me from India, some are joining me from the UK. So keep an eye on the show times, because some are much earlier in the day, some of this normal time. So keep an eye on that. Then beyond that, we go into uh, history. We analyze week. Then we've got lots of other weeks coming up in August, raids and special operations. We've got um, Arnhem week I'm planning in September, Battle of Britain week I'm planning. There's so many things coming up. So keep an eye on everything on social media. The link to Janet's website is in the description below, how you can get her books. That's all there below. Uh, I will add a link, I think, about to the museum. Janet talked about I'll add that after the show. And... Uh, beyond that, thank you, Janet, for joining me. Did you enjoy it? Oh, it was great. Thank you for having me. You know, it's funny that when I answered that Twitter, when I saw Lidacy, I said, no, <laughs> got to talk about Televog. Yeah, and it's like, you know, people say, uh, I think someone said, well, it's not as bad as Lidacy. Well, no, it's again, it's, it's not a league table of crimes. It's not like you can only do the top 10 of crime. This is just as worthy of examination as as a as a as a larger massacre just because the size of something is smaller doesn't mean it's less significant and it's a very i said it's indicative of what's happening in norway so for that reason it's very informative and we've enjoyed talking to you so there we are well enjoy the rest of your day janet for everybody else watching i will see you again tomorrow and this is paul Woodhead for world war ii tv saying enjoy the rest of your day thank you for watching everybody bye